stepped out of his car like in town or anything and walked across the street. Everybody stopped and looked at him. First, they'd hear the bring his squeak back into place when he got out because his mm -hmm. car came up about a foot. You know, it's a, it's a big and heavy. Start walking in. He, he was a giant. What was his name again? Axel? Big guy. Dad, what's his name again? Pardon? What was his name again? Axel Esterberg. Esterberg? Was yeah. he, where was he from? Esterberg, yeah. Where'd he come from? I think he was born in this country. I'm not sure. From Sweden, I think. But hmm. Well, he was Swedish, but I don't know if he was born hmm. you know, in this country or not. I, never, I don't remember. How, how did your dad come over? You told me he first went to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Your dad, did he first went to Minnesota? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I was just hoping you would talk about that again. How your dad came here and then he first went to Minnesota yeah. and what happened well, then? Yeah, in the woods. Okay. And then? Yeah. For, for how long do you know? Or? Pardon? For how long? Oh, I think probably a bigger part of a year. Okay. And kind then? Of in a field of the country and... They didn't know any English, and they got taken a lot, too, you know, because, you know, they didn't know really what people were saying. So, so... And then he, he left there because they kind of treated a lot of the guys like slaves, you know. Is that so, right? Um, he was loading lumber into a regular, uh, well train car, you know. Okay. They were enclosed, but they piled finished lumber in there. And, and that was quite a chore to fill those things with lumber, you know. <coughs> and then that pusher was after him and gave him a bad time. And he didn't like that pusher very well anyway. And he was trying his darter to get a little more lumber in there. But then there was two little openings, kind of shutters for it. Top had to close those before they, you know, piled up any higher. And that one was stuck or something. And so um, Dad was trying to close it, but they, they had a round kind of a pole made for it, you know, or to reach up and hook it and, and close it. And this guy hollered at him, called him names too, and everything. I guess Dad had had it, so he. This pole slipped, it hit him right over the head. The pusher? Yeah. Oh, just, that just, was the accident, huh? Dad was gone. That's when he went to L.A. <laughs> and how did he get there? I guess they never, no. The guy probably lived all right. Well, how did he get to L.A.? Pardon? How did he get to L.A.? I never really inquired uh, about that. There was a, they were like, it seems they had quite a few, just kind of just regular, the, well, the big wagons, stagecoach things. Oh, is that right? They moved across most of those, yeah. But I think he had, they had a train there somewhere, too. It went part way by train, but I don't think the train was, the tracks were clear across to where he was going, you know. Well, that had to have been about 19... And Oh, two or something, because um, that must have been about 1902, because they, um, your brother, your mother and your brother came over in 1904. Yeah, it probably was about 1902, yeah, something like that, or maybe a little before, yeah. Yeah. So there couldn't have been very many cars at that time. Yeah. So that only leaves um, wagons and trains. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, I know when they uh, had to buy his visa or pass, it cost quite a bit. Yeah. From Finland out. But then when he got over there to, uh, he mentioned a place in London or something where they get on a big ship to cross the Atlantic, but then they had to mail that thing back. Oh. So someone else could use it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is that right? They yeah. were recycling the visas? <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, it was a scheme. It made money. 
Mm-hmm. But right away, as soon as he'd been in the country long enough, well, he applied for citizenship and took the regular required tests and so on. You know. Do you know why they chose to leave? Pardon? Do you know why they chose to leave Finland? Did well, they ever he, say? Uh, <clears throat> Russia and Finland always had a fight going. Yeah. And I think Dad said, I think he was 17 or 18 years old, and he had you know, something like that, maybe 19, I, I don't remember exactly, but he al- already owned a shoe shop. He was a shoemaker. Okay. And he was doing pretty well. He owned his own shop and everything. And was that in Akonos? It was going very good, and then suddenly the... This Russia and Finnish thing kind of showed up again. Some of the Russians moved in and took a little portion of of Finland, which included his uh, shop too. You know. His oh shop. really? So, but oh, they made him all kinds of offers because most of the soldiers, Russian soldiers, were walking soldiers, and they come to the shoe shop and boots and stuff. You know, my God, that's the most important thing in the world. They made him a lot of offers, but um, he was found someone that wanted to buy his shop, so he, uh, that's when he came over, and that was the reason. Then he sold the shop and decided, well, if they're going to come and take over like they did here, and I, I'm i not going to be here any longer, so that's when he checked around, found the visa, and well, mm-hmm. they had those things going all over anyway. <clears throat> and so he had to pay for it, but he had the money, so he it cost quite a bit. And then he came across. But that was the reason. Oh, that's very interesting. I noticed when I was over there that all the streets had different names. Oh, yeah. And so they, um, what was the name of the street? G- Gustav Wasa Garten, or... Ikonagra Gotham. Gotham is street. I, I thought it was Gustav Wasagaten, but. Pardon? I thought the name of it was Gustav Wasagaten. Oh, yeah. But it well, could have yeah, changed. Of, uh, it yeah. could have changed, yeah. Because I think the names did change after the Russians yeah. kind of showed up. Yeah, and the street that my mother sent. Uh, Letter to her, to her mother was I know now how to say it, Nikolai Vagi, Nikolai Gotten. That's right, Nikolai Gotten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that might be the one that changed. Yeah. To Gustav Wasa Gotten, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that anyway, might have been it. Um, and my dad's horse's name was when he was logging over there in Finland was Naskus. Oh yeah, the horse's name. Yeah. Yeah. And then his dad was killed by a horse that kicked. Maybe I told you. Yes, yeah, yeah, I remember you mentioned that. But didn't your mom have a, a sister that stayed back in Finland? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I forgot her name now, but. Didn't you tell a story too about a some kind of logging accident in Finland that happened, or something along those lines, in the family? The only thing that I can remember, my dad talking about when <clears throat> my dad and his father were out there logging and. They wanted to do a little more logging, but it was getting towards spring, and the ice on the lake was getting thinner and starting to thaw, you know, but they wanted to work a little longer. And they were pulling these logs. Of course, they pulled easy on that ice, you know, anyway. And then um, they had a spot there where it thawed a little more, and the ice broke through, and he and the horse and everything went into the water. And his dad said he saw him there and it, it was so cold, you know, <laughs> he said he's just shaking and he said, stay away, stay, get away, get away, you know, so he wouldn't fall into, you know, uh-huh. and now how he got out, no one knows, but he showed up. <laughs> Did he save the horse? Pardon? Did, 
I don't know. I, I really don't remember. Well. Any other stories from Finland that you remember them telling? Pardon? Any other stories from Finland you remember them telling you? Well, didn't they work in a brewery? I thought there was a story about... Pardon? Did they work in a brewery? Oh, did yeah. They, there was some job there they had in a brewery? Well, I know when I went there, there was a brewery. There's a brewery in the town of Akinos. That's right. Well, that's, I think, where um, the grandmother worked for years in a brewery, as they call it, a brewery. The brewery. Yeah. She left, left in the morning for a little kind of a lantern thing to have a light. When she came home, we had the lantern again for years. Well, I guess so, because the winters, they're short days, aren't they, yeah. up there? Yeah. And I don't know, she, my mother told me, do you know how many years? She worked here for years, anyway. What was her name? Pardon? Do you know what was her name? I'll think about it, maybe I'll remember. Hmm. Well, well, your mother's name was Wilhelmina, right? Pardon? Your mom's name, Wilhelmina? Yeah, Wilhelmina Holdine. Holdine, yeah. Yeah. Is Holden that. Or whatever it's how, and how did they call her? Did they call her Wilhelmina or did they have a short version? How? Well, okay, I'll think. You know, it's super close to her. Some kind of nickname or something? Or? Pardon? Did she have a nickname? Kind of a nickname? It seems like she had a nickname. I don't remember what it was. Well, she had a sister. Willa or something. Willa, something like that. Willa or Willa? Or Willa. Willa. Mm -hmm. She had a sister named Amanda. Oh, mm -hmm. I remember reading a letter that she wrote or got from her sister. I remember that name, Amanda. And I really. You said there's the one that you've been kind of corresponding with or something. Oh yeah, Susan. Pardon? Susan. Susan. Oh yeah. Yeah, her. She said she's the last one with the name Lag over there. Was that right? Yeah, but we established that that's a an actual relative. Oh, mm -hmm. Well, to you anyway, yeah. So we, it goes back about three grandfathers oh, I see. back, yeah. but we found yeah. the common, common ancestor. So that's for sure a legitimate one. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Now, your dad, he came from a town called Snapper Tuna. Yeah. 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 Not very far away from Mekinos, but a different town. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But when the Russians took over, why he sold, he sold out. He wouldn't work for him. Because when they went to school and all, why they drilled them to dislike the Russians because the Russians and the Finland though and the Finns always fought had for centuries, you know, so right. that was bad news. And of course Martin the older 
was born there in, in Finland. Yeah. And then Ben, or Ben Charles, the next Polish, was born here. Yeah. And which one came after that? Pardon? Which one came after that? Which, which, who was born after Ben? Bank. Florence. Florence? Yeah. Then Virginia, then Mary, then Helen. Okay. Helen was the youngest and Florence yep. was the oldest. Of the girls? Yeah. Yeah. And then you were born after which one? Something I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. Well, Eddie was the last one born, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you were born before him. Yes. So who was before you? I'm not, who was born before you? Helen. Helen? Okay. Yeah. And before Helen? Then Mary, and then Virginia, then Florence. Okay. And then Ben, and then Martin. Okay. Yeah. So I remember you telling a story about your brother, Eddie, being at the table, that big, long table in the farmhouse. Yeah. And I remember he had a spoon in his hand. Oh, yeah. You want to tell me that again? Yeah, I remember he had one of those real peppy mornings where he couldn't sit still and then they had mush, you know. And so he had his big spoon there, and, you know, and he couldn't wait. He just acted up to it. So he passed the cream and the sugar and the cream, and it's funny, he dipped in and threw it so hot mush in his face, and then he screamed. <laughs> he wasn't very old. Dad was there, so well, that should teach him sit still at the table. <laughs> so I remember at the farmhouse, I remember there was at the pitch of the roof, the kids' bedroom was up in the top part. Oh, yeah. And uh, so, how did they ever fit all those kids into those two little rooms? Yeah, they pretty crowded there. Uh, we had two bedrooms downstairs, and I slept in that same bedroom that Mom and Dad slept in for quite a while. And Banks and Martin had another bedroom downstairs. Uh huh. I'm off the kitchen. I kind of yeah. remember that. Yeah. The, the, uh, the girls were upstairs. Oh, all yeah. the boys were downstairs. And then later on, they kind of. It was just kind of an attic thing, and then they made another bedroom out of that, you know, attic thing. Yeah. And then I had that room. Of course, not a bad room. Uh-huh. There was a pepper tree, a great big pepper tree outside the window. Oh, yeah. We used to climb that thing and jump out the window and grab that and slide down. And what? We were in a hurry. It's easier to go steps. Almost wore out that window, open and closing it. <laughs> and why would you want to get out of there in a hurry? Pardon? Why would you want to get out of there in a hurry? Oh, well, I just play it. Oh, yeah. okay. I thought you mentioned a story one time about somebody, a parent looking for you or something. Something had gone sideways for you or something oh, like yeah. that. Oh, well, yeah, we sneak in when we had to. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. That'll be only. There was a little kind of a rose bush there, too, that had kind of a trellis built, you know, those step things in it, which get the, up that and then swing up on the tree and then in, you know. Uh huh. We had that down pretty well. 
Well, the, I know those, uh, the staircase going up into that was sure steep. It sure was, yeah. That was a narrow thing, more you like a ladder. You that, you hit the bottom pretty mm -hmm. fast. <laughs> it was more like a ladder than a staircase. Yeah, I, I remember that. <clears throat> <laughs> so you built that little, that bathroom that was outside yeah. the kitchen? Yeah. How I wasn't very old when I built that. How old were you? About. When I built that, you mean? Uh huh. I could have been 15 or 16, I think. Oh, yeah? So, so what made you think to do it, to build it? Well, I, first of all, we need a place for a washer and dryer, you know, too. Because we had, you know, there wasn't room in the house for all. Things and then took all those sections there, I'll build a little bit wider and and put the bathroom, toilet, and bathtub, and everything in there. You know. What did you have before that? Just the outhouse and and just soap and water and stuff. You know. Oh, you didn't have running water in the house. Well, we had running water in the house. Yeah. Oh. But not till then did we have hot water too, because see, then we put a water heater in there, and I hooked that in, so you turn that out, get hot water in the house. Oh, okay. Was there always electricity, or when did you get electrical power at the farm? Well, there's a number of years we didn't have electricity, yeah. And then, because Dad wired it several years before they ever put the power line in, and it got delayed some way. And when he heard it was going to be a power line there, we'd be able to hook up to, I, he went ahead and wired it, but still waited a couple of years. Yeah. You know, before they put the power poles in. <coughs> it was kind of nice, but had electricity for a change. How many acres was that farm? That first one was only 15 acres. Oh. And then, of course, they added more to it. They bought the 15 acres when they left L.A. Okay. They had the house on it and the barn. Okay. It seemed like it was bigger than that, though. Pardon? It seemed like there was more than 15 acres there. Or did they and have they land? Added, I think they bought another 10 right onto it, too, yeah. Okay. So there would have been more. But those were old grapevines. They'd been there for a long time. Yeah. They did bear pretty nicely. It, of course, uh, Bank was really the one that studied these things, the agricultural stuff. And the old grapevine, someone said, pull them out, plant new ones. But, uh, then someone told him there was a way to trim them back to where they'd kind of rejuvenate and you know, start bearing well again. He did that. They did bear well, you know. Yeah. And the demand that they were, the, those were that 15 acres of all, well, biggest part of it was muscat grapes. <coughs> that was used for making sweet wine? Pardon? What did they use muscat grapes for, making sweet wine? I didn't follow you. What kind of wine do they make with muscat? Oh, they make, uh, well, made the muscatel. Yeah. And then, of course, they could make any color they wanted because then the Alicante grape was a red color one. If it, you could put throw that in and everything turned red, you know. Uh-huh. didn't matter what you had. That's why they could, you know, quite a bit of leeway when they made wine and poured, you know, several tons of grapes in one of those big vats to sort of ferment. Uh-huh. You know, <coughs> a lot of times it was a combination of grapes that they, yeah, it got a good buy on, but they're good grapes. But I mean, yeah. they could call them muscatel because yes, there was quite a few muscats in there. But they added whatever they found and threw in there. And uh, did they make wine at your farm, at your own place? Did you have wine making there, or did you no, only sell it no, to Galliano? Made his own there. Oh, just for home use. Yeah. Yeah.
And what about the prop? Didn't they have a place down in Borrego Springs also? Yeah. Yeah. I still have that. That's the place I have down there, yes. Yeah. So how did how did they get down there sometimes? I don't know. Well, I don't know how they ever found that down there, but uh, because it's quite a ways away and traveling from the ranch there in Riverside down there was, it wasn't that many miles, but it seemed forever to get there, you know. What kind of car did you have? Well, all we had was an old Model T truck, and I think we had a Model T kind of a, they call it a touring car, just regular car. <clears throat> and so how did you keep all those kids entertained on a long trip like that? Oh, okay. how, how did you keep all the kids entertained? On a trip like that, didn't your brother do something, sing or something? You mean uh, at home when we were there? Or? Well, on a car trip. Well, usually when we went on a car trip, there were so many of us that we drove the old truck and we had a canvas over the back. And half was over the back, <laughs> yeah. But didn't your brother come up with a song? With a what? A song. Your brother came, invented a song. To make the kids happy oh, while you... Oh, yeah. Yeah, they come... <laughs> Martin, I think it was. Yeah. Well, that was one time that I think the truck broke down there by Warner Springs somewhere, you know. Uh-huh. They didn't have very many bridges. They had to drive through river bottoms or creek bottoms, you know. Uh-huh. Something broke when we went through there. And we were stuck and had to start fixing it, I remember. Then it was Martin's job to babysit us younger kids. But he wasn't a very good babysitter. He didn't have much patience, you know. If you didn't mind, he'd get very rough, you know. Mm -hmm. And we were always picking on him, too. <coughs> it was a hell of a mess. <coughs> yeah, he sang to us about uh, the grooves that I shown there, being the frogs were. Here at night there along that creek, God, you just hear it. It's almost deafening. There's so many frogs and toads, you know, hollering. <coughs> yeah, I remember he just made that song up. Grew up strong or yabbing or song, meaning the frogs were singing a very, very rough song and they sung their karota tuta. Karota tuta meant nothing. But he had to fill in, so I remember what he sang. <laughs> and then we were supposed to go to sleep but <coughs> get pretty annoyed if it didn't work you were supposed to go to sleep in the truck or in the Pardon? in the car you were supposed to sleep in the car we were in the back of that truck as a rule and that's what he wanted you to go to sleep in yeah that, uh -huh. yeah we had some mattresses up there and everybody laid down there no oh, okay that's that thing you know because most of us went along when we went down to the district it was kind of a mess. Did you just kind of camp out there in the desert? Were you camping? Well, of course, that, when several of the guys got out of the car, out of the truck, and slept in the house, and we had some of us still stayed in, in the truck because it's not bad, you know. Oh. Because there's too many people for the little cabin. That, the, there was just a little cabin down there? That's all there was yeah. there? It's gone now. Uh, Trina and I went down there that one time uh -huh. two years ago. And the cabin was shot. Of course, the cabin wasn't ours anymore because well, the other kids inherited part of it. And yeah. I think Martin and his wife uh, inherited the, uh, the one with the cabin. And, Apparently the cabin had burned because it was still parts of it there, but huh. it burned down. Tell me that story about the rattlesnake bite again. Oh, yeah, when <clears throat> we were clearing brush down there uh, in, well, Borrego Valley, and um, under the homestead, I actually had to clear completely clear cut. So many acres, you know, and uh -huh. that's what we were doing. A lot of sagebrush and 
old virgin stuff there. And, and we kill maybe 20 or 25 of the big sidewinder snakes every day, you know. Wow, that's a lot of snakes oh, every day. And they were deadly. They, they were they were they were much longer than that, but they had a flat head. And they um, they were pretty deadly snakes. And so uh, they had the old uh, that old prospector. They called him Doc Beatty, and he uh, he'd come over and sit and watch us work. And he was pretty helpful too. Uh, he'd show us how to use the the pick and the shovel and axe and anything else, you know, so we could get the job done and still not use up too much energy. You, know? <laughs> you, you guys are young, you can do it, but you're a little older. You get to kind of work all day long, you're just about dead, so you better learn to do it right, you know. <clears throat> but he was always there giving advice or talking to us. He was a pretty nice little guy. They said, they always said he'd murdered a couple of people down there, but they could never stick him with it. So. He was the only one there when they found the body, so he was kind of a pretty much sort of suspect there. Anyway, I was chopping with the brush hook, you know, and down and pulled him back, you know. And a lot of times we hooked those snakes, they were in there, you know. And we learned, we were watching, and when we pulled a snake out, we cut all the way, you know. Yeah. It took a little time as rule to coil and strike, you know, not very long, but we were watching for it. But that day, that one got me. I didn't get away from it soon enough. And, and so, when I looked down there, it got me right in the area the airway. Uh, he said, did, did it get you, kid? I said, yeah, it did. Well, he says, um, we were too far away for anywhere to get help, from a hospital or anything like that, so I'll take care of it for you. I said, well, all right. So he, uh, he took one of the shoelaces out of his boot and put a restrictor band here. He said what he was doing. He told me, well, it's, you're tougher than any damn snake you ever put on this earth here. You make it okay. But he said, they are really poisonous, so he said, you've got to kind of uh, just release it a little at a time so not too much of the venom gets into your system all at one time. And then we'll take care of the rest of it too. But he said, that that's the kind of hold from all hitting your uh, your heart and bloodstream all the time. And then the minute he done that, why well, he said, and then we have to kind of cut this a little bit here and, and drain it good, you know. I didn't like the idea very well, but he had no pocket knife and he sharpened it on a rock. And then he, uh, I was out on my knees and he was out on his knees. And, uh, but he was very clever. He, uh, when he said, well, you're ready? I said, yep. So I put my arm down and, they put his big knee on his arm, and there was a rock there, so he made a point to make that hurt like hell, so he could, you know, so you wouldn't realize he was kind of slashing the other thing. So he did that, and it bled pretty freely, and he said, well, that way, he said, you, you know, we did get rid of quite a bit of poison there. So he said, there's some naturally is going to get through, but he said, uh, we got rid of quite a bit, so, um, so I did pretty good. I, about two days, I was pretty slow, and my arm just felt pretty heavy and everything. And they started getting better, and I was okay. How old were you? Probably around 16 or something like that. Pretty young, yeah. yeah. He always wanted us to bring him gifts or whiskey when we came down. We usually did. But if we had any whiskey hidden there, Dad used to hide some whiskey for himself, you know, if he came down like in the winter and it got difficult, cold in winter, you know. 
you'd like to have a good sort of coffee and pour a little whiskey into it, you know. Hmm. But we never could hide it well enough. Baby would find us and drink it before we got back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. He knew we knew it, too. Hmm. We even lowered it somewhat down with a string down the well, you know. Oh, yeah? He got that, too. <laughs> Do you know why they called him Doc? I don't know, but as far as I'm concerned, after he helped me with that deal, right. after he wrote us, maybe he, he was a baby, all right. Maybe he was a doctor of sorts, yeah. huh? Well, <laughs> he was a rough old guy, though. He was real proud of himself. So how come he was there in Borrego Springs? Or? I don't know, but he'd been there a long time, and every now and then they have a roundup and you catch some of these wild burrows and sell them, you know. Uh -huh. We got it on that one time he went over to help him over and they're going to make a roundup <coughs> on horses and see if they get out the wilderness and get them moving ahead and then into a big pen he made, you know. <laughs> Worked back pretty well. I think I captured about six of them. Hmm. And uh, it was funny that one though, it was crude kind of a penny that way, I mean, out of the Ocotillo cactus, you know. Ocotillo, yeah. The post, uh, you know, the, the funny, and up and then interwound and some metal, some metal fencing in on it too, you know. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, but I remember that one, when we had them all shoved in there and closed that gate, that one just went a little word from a little way from the gate and took one look and then ran and he got over that fence and out. <laughs> he didn't really break it down. He just kind of got up and almost cleared it and then kicked a little and he, he was free and he took off. <laughs> I was surprised to see that because that was pretty high. <laughs> Then he kind of tried to get him a little bit tame so he could sell them. They're hard to deal with, those guys, you know. They, they try to bite you and everything else. And they're wild. I didn't want any part of those darn things. Anything else in the desert happen? Good stories? Pardon? Any other stories about things in the desert? <clears throat> Not too much. If I told you a story about when we had a load of lumber and entering the valley where that steep grade was only up about, it wasn't more than maybe 100 feet, but it was steep. And the problem with that old truck was uh, actually they had a cog wheel where it was made out of a regular Ford touring car, but where the wheels had been on a touring car, there they put a sprocket and added another, you know, eight or ten feet onto it, and, and that sprocket served as a chain and to, to drive the, this thing. And the chains would break every now and then, and so that we were working on a little cabin. <clears throat> and we had almost, we got down there with, without too many problems that trip. Then going up that hill, like, uh, we started up there, and it didn't look like they were going to make it to load us heavy, so they rolled back down, and then Dad would try to figure out what to do. And uh, so we were only about 10 miles then from the home site. You know, so we figured if we unload part of the lumber right there at the bottom of the hill and run on down to the home site and unload what we had, then come back and pick up the rest we had made. 
And then he got to change his mind and decided he'd try to make it. So he was driving this thing and he had Martin standing right there, right by the back wheel with a big kind of a chalk thing, a big piece of wood you could throw under this wheel in case the chain broke as I roll him back. He'd stop and hold it. Or got almost to the top and then the chain broke and he rolled back just far enough to where, where Mark threw that chalk in there, but he, he still rolled over it and then got it. And then it was loaded so heavy on the back that the, his front wheels were up in the air, you know, and they were steering and they weren't even touching the ground so it rolled clear to the bottom. Oh boy. So then that time that he decided to uh, have Martin go down and see him, old Doc Beatty and get some, um, you know, a double team of horses and get them hooked onto this thing too. So and we did and we made it, but we lost a day on that deal. But we got there. It must have been hard for horses out in the desert like that. Pardon? Must have been hard for horses out in the desert like that. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was. Um, oh, and it was getting towards the evening when Martin was supposed to walk over to Doc Baby's place, you know, I remember Dad cautioned him about um, the rattlesnakes. See, they, there really wasn't a road. It was just kind of tracks where we, we, we drove, you know. We put it in tracks, but, um, and in these tracks, the rats would run back and forth here. And here's where these snakes were caught uh, rats, you know. So oh. don't walk in that deal. Walk in the middle of it. Oh. Those snakes will nail you, you know. Oh, wow. Anyway, we made it and came back. <laughs>